Hey, well, hello everyone. I guess we'll get started here. So welcome to the Forestry Adaptation Community of Practice webinar today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Annette Morand, and I am the facilitator of the online adaptation communities of practice, and those are run by us here at OPR, which is the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources, and we're located at Laurentian University in Southern Ontario. So the way the webinar will run is as follows. So after this short introduction, we will have the main presentation, which will go for about 30 minutes or so. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll, ha we'll have some time left over for any questions that you have for the presenter. So if you have any questions during the webinar, we just ask that you please hold them until the end. Um, and before we get going, I just have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, so first, for those of you who dialed into the conference call line, uh, your lines have been automatically muted. Um, and the reason for this is just to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. So to ask a question during the Q&A period, all you're going to have to do is hit star six, and that will unmute your line. Um, but please do keep things muted during the presentation. Also, you'll notice that there's a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, you can use this chat box to field any questions that you might have for the presenter. Um, as well, if you have any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can also use this chat area to type a message, or you can also click on my name and send me a private message, and I will try to help you as best as I can. Um, I also want to mention that we are recording the webinar today, and I'll be sending out a copy of the recording to all those who have pre-registered with me, and we'll be posting it to the practice website. And finally, I know we have some people on the line who may not be familiar with what the forestry adaptation community of practice, or the FA COP, is. Uh, so I wanted to take this opportunity just to quickly mention that it's an interactive online community that's dedicated to those who are working in forestry or those who are simply interested in forestry and climate change adaptation in Canada. It includes features such as news articles, events, an online library, uh, discussion forums, and much more. So it's free to join. Uh, if there's anybody on the line today who's interested in more about the FA COP, please just click on the link in the chat box more information and register. So with that being said, we're very excited to have Dan McKenney on the line with us today to talk about climate, economic, smart, forest regeneration. And just so you know a little bit more about your presenter, Dan is a senior scientist and team leader with Natural Resources Canada's Canadian Forest Service in Sault Ste. Marie. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Guelph, McMaster, and the University of Toronto. His research interests include the development and integration of climate data in economic and ecological studies and decision making. And Dan has also worked for the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and the Australian Centre for International Agriculture Research. He has a PhD in forest economics and policy from the Australian National University, a master's in resource economics from the University of Guelph, and a bachelor of science in forest science from Texas A&M University. So on behalf of everyone joining us, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you, Dan, for taking the time to present this webinar for us today. It is very much appreciated. So without further ado, I will now hand things over to you. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, I will try to speak clearly into the telephone here, and hopefully everybody can hear me well. So I just wanted to start with by acknowledging other people that have been involved in this work. Uh, John Pedler and Glenn Lawrence work here in St. Marie. Me and Jing and Alphonse, uh, Jing with the Master's Degree, professor there in the uh, Agriculture Resource Economic Art. So, next slide. All right. I just wanted to provide a bit of context before I jump in. So, I think uh, all of you who are involved in the forestry game probably know that. Global pressures such as climate change, forest fragmentation, invasive species, and a number of other things have certainly made forest management increasingly complex today. Climate and weather has always played a fundamental role on the nature of forests, but the rapidity of recent and projected change is challenging a number of the paradigms that forestry professionals deal with, including thinking about, natural, uh, about regeneration. Human input into regeneration efforts certainly help to establish what our, forest, our future forests will look like, but they're not the only driver. And so now it would appear that we really do have some conundrums that we will have to face in the, next, in the coming decades if you believe the climate projections that have been put forward by the uh, 
These projections suggest changes in climate that are well beyond what our forest systems have uh, possibly experienced. In this talk, I want to address this issue by a case study of sorts on uh, two important species, black spruce and white pine. It's mostly centered around the province of Ontario or the Great Lakes region, but I think the case study uh, and its peculiarities are interesting in and of itself, but there are larger issues at play, one being just the health and productivity of future forests, and also perhaps even the use of economic thinking to help frame and analyze the problem. I obviously, if you're listening in, you think this is important, but I certainly do. Forests cover over 30% of Canada, that's more than 3,000, sorry, 3 million square kilometers, provide ecological goods and services, including, um, you know, wildlife habitat for species of interest to humans, uh, carbon sequestration, and of course, wood products for both domestic and foreign consumption. We do artificial regeneration on about half of the forests that are that are harvested annually, and the rest occurs naturally. The rest of the regeneration occurs naturally to standards that we have uh, as a profession sort of collectively agreed upon. What I want you to keep in mind: this is as much a, a thought experiment as as any kind of how-to or cookbook. There are no panaceas, but I think that careful and critical thought and our actions on these issues will indeed shape the forests of the future for, for future generations. Next slide here. This, this is a little bit of a more detailed depiction of, of climate changes that are both recent and uh, are coming. There are many different definitions of growing season. Growing season is obviously something that I think people are probably well familiar with. And while each species deals with um, heat sums and temperatures in its own way, it's clear that bioclimatic variables like these are changing. What you see here are four maps that uh, we here have been involved with uh, depicting climate change. The top one on the left is growing season length uh, over the 1951 to 80 period, 30 year average. Then you can see the second, put the arrow button. So this map here shows that you can just see by the, the changes, the colors, the patterns that the growing season lengths are, have increased in that period. And in the period that we, we actually are already in, this 2011 to 2040, you can see projected changes, just the more and more green showing up, which is a longer growing season. And by the end of the century, according to the 8.5 Canadian uh, uh, circulation model, you can see that it uh, depicts growing season lengths that are, are quite dramatic to change. I have a little picture of the mountain pine beetle in there, and mountain pine beetle, um, I'm sure you all know, has, has caused havoc to the forests of Western Canada. Some 18 million hectares uh, have been affected, and as the uh, insect is moving eastward, the mountain pine part of the mountain pine beetle's impacts are attributed to changes in minimum temperatures. So, you know, this is one example of how climate can affect our forest. The next one is, a, is another picture of another climatic variable that is important. Uh, this is a, a dryness index. That This index is also likely to shape our future forest. These images here show changes in an annual dryness index that was developed by Ted Hogg, who is a uh, Canadian Forest Service scientist based in Edmonton. This in index takes both temperature and precipitation into account. And even under aggressive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, these maps show that uh, fairly large changes in dryness uh, that are projected through the course of this century. The important thing here is that even relatively small changes in dryness have been strongly correlated, correlated with species distributions and large-scale disturbances like fire. So this is another example of a climate variable that shown to be important already. And finally, I just wanted to show some work that uh, this is some work that we ourselves here have been involved with under what we call the Plant Hardiness Project. In this project, we've gathered literally millions of observation points across North America of, of the locations of plants. These data come from Organizations like the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, the U.S. Forest Service, the Nature Conservancy, various conservation data centers. And from these models, 
we've developed climatic domain maps for literally thousands of individual species. You can look at these maps online at the Plant Hardy website. For trees, the, the, the core or green areas that you can see on the map, bring this arrow back up here, these greenish areas, um, they're, these outline very closely the known natural distributions of, of the tree species that we've looked up looked at. In this particular case, we've got uh, sugar maple shown here. Um, and our analyses have shown that um, over the last 50 years, these climate envelopes have moved about 60 kilometers on average for about 130 commercial or let's say major tree species that we've looked at in North America. And if the GCMs are, are close to correct, particularly ones like the 8.5 scenario that I'm a little bit on the higher end of greenhouse gas emission projections. This shift could be about 700 kilometers north by the latter part of the century. So that's quite a remarkable shift. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that you should believe these. And most importantly, I'm not saying that these are these are where the species is going. Actual species migration, these, these are just climate envelopes. These are showing where the climate habitat of the species. And actual migration of the species, of course, a lot more complicated. I'm not going to get into that here. But it's certainly models like this would suggest that many of the species that we are that we work with are going to be outside of their comfort zone going forward. Now to the to the topic of the day here, which is um, really to do with what is the cost or value of seed source change choice under a changing climate. Say that five times fast. Um, so uh, a sustainable or re re reforestation or even forest restoration plan would, you would think, I think most people would agree, try to be appropriately matched to future climate. What exactly that means is something that I'm still uh, under discussion. There are two kinds of seed source decisions that I wanted to talk about here, and I want to do this because they are important. Uh, one is called deployment, and one is called procurement. So the deployment question is, I have seed from a place and I want to take it someplace else but to different parts or different regions. Uh, the procurement is I have a regeneration site and I want to get seed that's, that's appropriately matched to the place. So in this study we're going to compare forest regeneration, let's say changes in growth and also the economic value associated with this using basically three kinds of choices. One is a local seed. Another is this little tool that we call Seedware, and I'll explain this a little bit later. And another thing called Universal Response Function, and they help also to quantify the effect of, of moving seed around. So, um, as I volunteered or was volunteered to give this seminar, I, uh, it came to mind that I, I, this gives me a, perhaps a bit of an opportunity to solicit some views on this topic. So. You, for those of you who have joined in, I first of all want to thank you for taking time out of your day to do this, but I, I want to give you a test question at the end of the seminar. I want, and, and I want you to please send in your answer. You can use the chat line, or I guess you could email me, but just the chat line to make it totally painless for you. I'm going to have a little question at the end, and all you got to do is type in two words. For those of you who are in a room full of people, please take a vote and we'll see. So, this is a bit of incentive for you to try to pay attention um, because you will be tested at the end. I want your opinion about something. Okay. So this is uh, a little bit of a story here about the Seedware tool. Seedware is just really a play on words. Probably some of you I know uh, who are on this call have heard about this before. Seedware is just a very simple kind of climate matching approach. It uh, It's used used to try to produce maps that show the climate similarity of places. So it, it's a little, it's a very simple metric, a number between 0 and 1, and the closer the value is to 1, the more closely the selected place matches the, the well, climate. So you can see the map at the top is current climate example. So here we've picked a place, I think this is somewhere near North Bay, Ontario, and the reddish color shows where the climate is similar to that climate today. Okay, so pretty simple. See, the further away you get, uh, generally north or south, the, the metric suggests it's not as similar. Pretty simple. 
nothing magical about that. But sometimes, in fact, you will see places where uh, the colors are the same that you might not have thought of. So it's a little bit counterintuitive. And I can say that part of the thinking with this, and that mentioned I did my PhD in Australia, and some of this work sort of, uh, it, is, it certainly influenced my thinking about this. And, and these kind of climatic models are actually quite powerful. Sometimes they, they do show places where um, species may not expect it so well, but then they've gone and searched them out. We've, we've used this kind of model uh, for uh, reptiles and amphibians in Ontario, and they found, for example, wood turtles, a place that had climatic similar to um, uh, places where there was. So it's, a, it's just a, a, another bit of tool in the toolbox to help uh, think about where things are distributed. So under a sort of climate change situation, um, we can also use this tool by doing things like here in this middle map. Hang on a minute. Where's the green line go? Oh, oh yeah. See, I'm a little red green colorblind. Thank goodness I have people in my room here to tell me where this green dot is, green arrow is. So now I've moved it to the middle map. And this is an example of the procurement problem. So this is saying, well, where where is this where is this climate going to come from where I am now? Okay, so you can see here this this map shows that the climate for North Bay in the future under this particular scenario that was used is going to come from uh, an area east of Lake Huron, the Great Lakes here, and there's also a similar climate east of Lake. Ontario. So this is giving uh, a potential user a sense of, well, where could I get climate that's going to match that where it's going to come from? Where is the climate going to be similar to um, where it is now? And the bottom map is an example of employment problem. Yeah, move the arrow. And this shows where is the climate from here going to move to in the future? So, pretty simple. I think this is just a, a way of thinking about the problem. And these maps can help identify this. It's, it's basically a little bit of a simple climate analog type of approach. But does this seedware tool really work? Um, in, in Ontario, in the Ontario Minister of Science Resources, I had the good uh, fortune of working with uh, Barb Boysen a little bit over the years. She's been a great advocate of the tool. Uh, but being uh, uh, you know, appropriately critical, we've, uh, we, we still want to try to test out this. And it turns out that uh, there are genetic trials or provenance trials that can help us do that. So um, here, um, one of the things that we've done over the last while is gather provenance trial data from across North America, from literature and contact with people. Uh, some acknowledgement to people here uh, in the Ontario Forest Research Store to us, uh, Bill Parker. There are two Bill Parkers. One is at Lakehead. And, uh, thank that Bill Parker too. Um, and Penjing Lu, Lu, sorry, and Steve Colombo. They've all been involved in helping us gather data that's uh, relevant work. So you can see the map on the the two maps of white pine and black spruce. These are just showing locations. The, the kind of gray or lighter dots show where seed has been collected from, and the triangles show where these, all these families have planted in a basically a provenance-wide, range-wide provenance trial. Um, and similarly, this is for white pine. So, what we've done now is we've analyzed this, got this provenance trial data, and we've analyzed it using universal response function approach. This, this particular approach was pioneered by Tong Lee Wang uh, at the University of British Columbia, sorry, British Columbia, with Sally Aitken and her colleagues at UBC. They are the real gurus in this work. Uh, they did approximately 2010, applied this model to large full pine. Uh, basically, this approach combined some sort of traditional response type functions that have been used in the genetics world over a number of years, which Traditional response functions show the growth of a single seed source across a range of, of, of test sites. And another approach is 
that this universal response function does is combine it with the traditional transfer function. So response function and transfer function. And the response transfer function shows the growth of a range of different provenances at a single test site. So this result is something called this URF equation, which is basically a, a multiple regression model that in principle can predict the growth of any seed source at any plant site for where you have the requisite climate data analyzed in relation to climate. And of course now we do developing models, spatial models of, of past climate, and we also have been interpolating uh, global circulation models. This so this basically provides us the tools to now allow us to compare in principle how close this kind of approach would be to the seedware approach. Hopefully I kept you on track here. And now here is the provenance, some results of this work that we've done and the uh, papers listed below. So both, it turns out that both species showed quite a significant relationship with mean annual temperature. We explored lots of different variables, uh, including precipitation uh, variables. Um, the R squared for um, uh, black spruce was uh, 0.35, which is pretty good for ecological study. For, um, and, and it showed that there was basically black spruce reached its maximum height around four and a half degrees, regardless of where the provenance originated. And similarly, white pine reached uh, its maximum height around 11, regardless of its provenance origin. So it's actually kind of an important point. Um, somewhat conversely, and, and maybe counterintuitively, there was relatively little difference be, uh, in, between the provenances at a given test site. So the, the, basically the genetic response is relatively weak. So just to summarize the URF study, local seeds are not necessarily best. This is not surprising. Um, for those of you who are involved in the game, you know that uh, there are often sort of super trees. Um, the Ottawa Valley is very well known for its beetroot source of white spruce, which seems to grow well all over. Um, you know, many species seem to have particular populations that grow well, but the kind of minimal risk approach is to generally to try to use both species. Uh, both species appear adapted to a central climatic optimum, and I put the term optimum in quotes because that's a little bit of a loose use of the term. It's not optimum the way economists call it optimum, but it's just that they tend to like that that value, the four and a half degrees for black spruce and the 11 degrees for white pine. So what does this say? This says that sort of northern populations would appear to be relatively well adapted to warming conditions. Things warm up, uh, generally climate's going to move north. Northern populations would probably tend to like that. Southern populations would appear to be more poorly adapted to warming conditions, sort of a general finding. But now this allows us to start thinking about the economics of this and also the growth response of sort of different choices. Local versus seedware versus URF. And that's, that's your test question there. Think about that. So here's a bit of uh, the economic analysis in a nutshell. And we do have a paper, I give the paper at the end, that get that explains it more, uh, more detail. But basically this, this URF allows us to make a spatial prediction of site index. So uh, site index is basically a height at a particular age. And um, this site index will now be going to be based on climate. Site indices are used to help generate estimate um, uh, marginal volume for a plate. In forest plants. So by using uh, climate change projections, uh, we now have a way to explicitly estimate yields that are adjusted by beliefs about future climate. So that's basically what we've done. We um, uh, now we're using some assumptions here. Uh, in this particular case, the numbers that I'm going to show you shortly. We're assuming a silviculture investment of about $300 a hectare, a discount rate of 4% future real stumpage value of $20 per cubic meter. These numbers could change. It, it could affect the result. 
Um, but all of those assumptions allow us to calculate a net present value of silver filter that reflect these different seed source options. Of course, there are lots of caveats in all this, but uh, I think the basic principle is uh, First of all, we're kind of assuming that growth and yield is indeed driven by climate, and I think you can, you can see that. The, the work, I think that's pretty generally accepted in our own work on the URF there. Also confirm that. Soils are not really explicitly included in these results, and that is an important thing, except so far as they're sort of implicitly reflecting the soil type problem trial type, right? So that's uh, one thing that's something that could be important. So the maps that I'm going to show you, just kind of take them as a little bit of a thought experiment there, that the soils, wherever these maps show, where maps are, are that you can find some in that region that somewhat. Um, and uh, in this example that we're going to show, we're really just using an app. We're, we're using the average for general circulation for one emission scenario, and that is the 8.5 RCP scenario, which is on the more sort of extreme end. But in fact, currently, greenhouse gas emissions are tracking above that level. So, so greenhouse gas emissions are actually worse than that at current. Um, so, um, those of you who would be involved in growth and yield modeling would know that the, that there are some circularity and other types of issues associated with site index calculation. People make their careers out of this stuff. But at the end of the day, we need growth and yield models to generate things like allowable cuts. So they're they're happening anyway, and uh, and and harvest plans. So and this net present value analysis that we're using here is trying to help assess the goodness or badness of the best net, net present value analysis. Basically, the main metric is cost benefit. So, okay, now I'm going to get to the issue here. But, okay, so this is the first scenario. This is black spruce seed procurement for Hearst. So, Hearst is a place up here. And, where'd the arrow go? Top oh, mountain. Top mountain. Well, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Oh, I know, I'm bad. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, there's there is Hearst, it's a face, place famous for MNR hockey tournaments. Um, so I'm gonna just start with this bottom map. So this is the seedware results of a seedware model. So this basically shows you the the um, the bluer the color, the more it's closer, the more the future climate here is gonna be like Hearst climate. Okay, so this is where this is where the the future is coming from. Okay, so that's pretty intuitive. It's going to warm up. It's going to basically be more similar to basically this suggests that the climate north of Lake Huron, a bit east of Lake Superior, is going to move up. That's what Hearst is going to look for in the middle to latter part of the century. Okay, so the the least similar climate. So the least similar climate are ones that are way up north and then further down south. So okay. So now we've applied, as I mentioned, that sort of approach to generate site and such. And what this shows is that um, this top map shows the net the results of the net present value analysis. And here on the left is the table. Now in the table I've included stand volumes as well as net present value analysis. I do know that uh, there are some foresters who do not like that. It discounts the future, so people think that it's not fair for forestry to kind of evaluate it in terms. That's a bigger kind of question, a little bit philosophical, but I think uh, what we've done here is show that, in fact, the seedware model looks like it works. That in, that the uh, the stand the the seedware index, the highest seedware index values are associated with the highest net present values. I've given the range here. So the mean for the the index value of 0.9 to 1 has the highest net present value, about $170 per hectare. And it also has the highest volume. So that's all good. See where it works. And it's a similar result 
for deployment. So um, again, so this map here, just because this takes a little bit of time to get used to, you know, we, we had to think about this with the deployment and procurement problem, there are different ways to think about it. So this map, top map, shows net present value. So this says that if C came from south, here, anywhere where the blue is, that would, and was planted in hers, that would be the value, okay? Deployment one, I'll show you later, the next for white pine, um, is a, a different map, the interpret different. So here's white pine C procurement again, though. And so let's look here at the bottom map. Here we're using, oh, what? <laughs> hang on. Okay. Um, so now we've gone to North Bay. It's a place well known in Ontario for white pine uh, near Algonquin Park. Beautiful white pine grows well there. So this seed where model down here would say that the climate further south, so down here, is going to move northward in the future, and this is what North Bay's climate is going to look like going forward using this particular climate change scenario. So similar to the black spruce story, white pine seed sources look like they're going to be fairly happy to move north. Seed where it works again, smiley face. Again, the, the higher the index value, over here are associated with higher net present values and also higher growth and yield. Okay. Now, next, the white pine seed deployment. And this is where it gets kind of interesting. And of course, things are only interesting if it doesn't work out the way you might plan. Um, so, basically, in this particular case, this is the story of white pine seed deployment. So the seed wear model would suggest that the climate from North Bay is going to move northward. So see here the band of darker blue that's saying this is where the North Bay climate is going to move to in the future. So if you wanted to deploy North Bay seed, you would think about moving it to these, you know, where the blue is. But when you apply the URF and calculate net present values, you get a very different result. So the universal response function, which I showed before and has pretty good statistics associated with it, suggested that uh, uh, white pine like climate, white pine populations all generally like the warmer climate, 11 degrees mean and temperature. So what it ultimately meant in terms of once we translate the that function into site index and so on, was that we're getting a situation where the seedware index is low, the lower seedware index is actually associated with a higher net present value. And here in this case, the yields are um, also uh, associated with a different seedware um, index value. The highest seedware index values in this case were not associated with in fact, they were you know, amongst some of the lower values associated with um, white pine. So all this is saying that white pine seed source generally prefers warmer climate, even warmer than this particular climate scenario suggests. Now that's kind of a, a bit of a eye-opener. I think that's a bit, uh, kind of a novel finding. Um, and it's Slide, basically, some of my conclusions out of all of this. So, um, <clears throat> I think that our science and computing technology is allowing us to get a lot better at predicting both physical and economic outcomes for forest management. Now, lots of science has gone on to try to improve growth and yield functions. There's people working on this all the time. I think we can be better at it, and I think we can integrate the two approaches, physical and economic Because there are growth and value differences. Uh, certainly, the analysis that we just looked at show differences in value and growth between seed source choices. I think everybody would have, have you know, I don't think that that's rocket science or 
all that heretical or uh, surprising. But we now have the ability to kind of look at in a more explicit way. We can look at them in maps. I think maps are useful because they force people to think about them. It's a little bit of a sharper edge. I also think that climate change is further complicating choices that forest managers uh, think about and, and all the risks associated with it. So I, I kind of think that economic analysis, economic thinking is relevant. It will challenge our thinking about what and how we invest in forestry. I'm not saying that there is a single answer. It's, that's not what good economic analysis would say, but it would help us think about trade-offs in a way. We, we wrote a paper uh, that kind of looked into that a little bit and published that in the Forest Economy last year as well. So all of that's my main point about this kind of analysis that, that we've shown, that I think that we can and could look at these sorts of questions in a lot more way. Because if, once you add all the, the numbers up over large landscapes, because provinces all deal with managing a large amount of forest, a lot of forest is harvested here, and relatively small difference in value and growth can make a big difference in the actual numbers. So I think it's worth our while to think about this a lot more. Something else that would help is the idea of trying to resurrect and continue to sit, well, to measure, remeasure, and save old provinces. Old science like this is really valuable, and you can't, you can't, and there's not a lot of science that allows us to basically save time. And, but resurrecting these kinds of trials would allow us to do that. Um, the, the simple climate matching that I showed with seedware does have some merit in some cases, but maybe not always. And this, uh, this makes it the thinking of this uh, important to also think about. Something that uh, John Pedler and myself have been working on a little bit more that is tied to that idea that it looks like black spruce really like four and a half degrees uh, and white pine like 11 degrees. The, this is something to do with the range position. Where you are reforesting or re trying to restore a forest, the optimal seed that you may want for that depends on the kind of climatic preference that a species has. We can actually quantify that uh, with the plant hardiness project that I mentioned. And we are working on that, trying to come up with some tools that will help rank species, if you like, climatic preference in relation to its, its core climatic uh, profile and the climate, the projected climate at a particular place. So I'd say stay tuned for that. Um, and lastly, I'd like to just ask you to send in your, your two cents worth. Basically, you just have to type one word before you go. Uh, what would you do with if you were deciding about seed source for your place? Would you pick local? Would you pick something based on a seedware model? Would you try to use a URF or some more advanced kind of genetic function that's available? Would you just take anything? That's not the one that I, uh, I put up there on the board, but um, is, would you just take anything? Or would you think that we need to keep thinking about this before we make decisions about the kind of policy or choices that we have to make? So basically, you got five choices. Local, seedware, URF, anything, or keep thinking. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, Anybody who wants to get in touch with me afterwards, please feel free. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, this is the paper that wrote up that explains a lot of this in more detail. And I just wanted to thank the, uh, the Canadian Forest Service Forest Change Project, which helped the fund work. So I think I'll leave it at that. I have been asked for what is this obscure picture on the right hand side of this last slide? This is a picture of my son holding a very poisonous brown snake in Australia. I got sent that picture while he was older, and I, I knew this. When I did my PhD in Australia, I know what a brown snake is, but it's not a kind of snake that you want to pick up. I think climate change, the, the symbolism here is that the metaphor is that climate change is a little bit like a brown snake. We don't really know. You've got to be darn careful. It turned out the snake was dead, but he didn't tell me that. <laughs> okay. Perfect.
Okay, well, thanks so much, Dan. Um, so we can actually take some questions now as well as people start to answer your test question there in the chat box, as you can see. Um, so if anybody has a question, you can also type that in the chat box, and please feel free to go ahead and do that. Uh, if you're on the conference call line with us, I would prefer to ask a question for the phone. You're just going to have to hit star six to unmute the line. So Johan uh, Fusset has a question in the chat box here. So regarding the relatively weak genetic variation among uh, provenances, I was wondering if the southern and northern limit provenances were included in the analysis you presented. Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, if I go back. map here I think is fairly comprehensive. So the black spruce I think you can see, I'm even a little far from the screen here myself, but you can see a number of gray dots here. Those are the populations uh, for black spruce. So this was actually a fairly you know, range-wide test of black spruce province tested at these locations here that are the, the triangles. Uh, white pine, you can see here again the white pine uh, seed sources came from places that were quite broad in terms of uh, species natural range and tested in a number of places uh, in the Great Lakes region, including at one site there in Ontario. Perfect. Thank you. I see some people typing, but is there anybody on the conference call line that would like to ask a question? Please feel free. Go right ahead. Okay, I have a question here. Oh, perfect. Anna? Yeah. Explain a little bit about what the implications are for using the southern end of the province. I can understand that it is not properly growing seeds to hit by frost. I understand yeah. that, you know. But what, what are the disadvantages or what we look at in seeing the provenance when theoretically? Keep the local yeah. people see. Well, there's a few. Yes, it's, uh, it's all related to that, uh, a lot of that. that and, and also maladaptation has, has essentially progressed. So if I go back to. Sorry, Dan. I don't really hear the, the question that I'm not sure okay. about others. Okay, so the, the question had to do with what are some of the risks associated with picking local seed? Um, what, what do you lose from picking local that, that sum it up in a nutshell? When you're not
for longer lived species, trying to pick something that's going to be adapted for much of its lifespan is kind of challenging. Okay, I think I'll leave that at that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so we have another question in the chat box here. So what's the phenotypic climate tolerance of different provenances? Well, um, um, well, I think a lot of things, I mean, even this, this plant hardiness project can show that, that trees can grow outside of their natural range. Quite often, in some cases, they grow very well. well Radiata pine is kind of classic example of that. And, Eucalyptus of going outside of its natural range. Um, one of the things that these maps show, these maps show here, is that basically these green areas are identifying places that are matching 90% of the of the of the climate of 90% of the observations that we have for this species in North America. Okay, so this, and as I said, this kind of matches the, the natural range, of, well, in this case, sugar maple, but it, it applies to all 130 of the main trees we've done. So as you look further into the future, what this is saying is that the climate where we know the species is happy in is moving to this far north, if you believe this climate change. And there is no place where it's currently growing now that will match the climate for the for the in this case there are six climatic variables that we've used. Uh, there are quick like annual mean temperature, minimum temperature the coldest month, maximum temperature the hottest month, some precipitation, annual mean precipitation. So this says that there's no place where sugar maple is growing that is going to be anywhere close to to its climate now in this area in the future. Now does this say that the species is going to just up and die? I I don't think so, but I don't really know. Does it suggest that there could be problems with reproductive processes? I suspect so. I suspect that the trees are going to be stressed. So this has, I mean, these are big questions that I don't have the answer of. I think models like this are as much ball like as anything. We're not, again, we are not saying that it's going to migrate. Like we are just saying this is where their climate habitat that we know suited for now is moving to in the future. And this is this is you know heavy stuff in a way. It's uh, difficult to, to know how things will truly be affected going forward with this kind of change. Okay, okay Annette. Perfect, yeah. That's great. So there are a few other people who are typing, I can see. Um, are there any questions on the conference call line while we wait? If not, uh, Melissa Spearing has a question in the chat box here. So, uh, is there any paleoclimatology or paleonology studies showing, for example, sugar maple might uh, have been that far north before? Um, yeah, well, paleo paleoclimatologists, they, they do kind of try to work at these sorts of things. And in fact, those are the people that have come up with the theories of a central climatic optimum. For species that what's happened during glacial periods is that they have migrated south into refugia and then they they basically you know mix the genes up and this is why they have a kind of a core climatic uh, preference and then as glaciers retreated the species have moved northward um, and have uh, um, you know continued their, their march north but at the end of the day they march north from a particular Place. So they've got that that kind of optimal or core preference. As far as are there ways in which they can tell or tie the you know let's say uh, records. I know that you know for example they find pine tree logs in the Arctic and so on. Some of that may come about at times when the, the Earth is much much warmer. So. Um, you know, it's actually quite difficult to come up with the, the climate values at those time periods in a fairly precise way. But basically, I don't think they exist in that case in, in the kind of Arctic condition that we know. Um, 
or in very, very warm conditions that uh, we say might get in the coming part of the century. So um, there are, I mean, one way that this kind of work can be uh, investigated is to gather kind of garden trial type information about where sugar maple or other species are planted around the world to develop these kinds of models. And that's something that we're trying to work on. Um, and you know, there are global databases about where people plant things. We, a lot of the plant hardiness data, at least, well, I'd say 15 to 20 percent comes out from outside the natural rain. So there are a lot of arboretums in, in North America that try to grow plants that are outside the natural rain. And we try to incorporate data where we can. Every case of herb tree different story behind it. Perfect. Great. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Um, so we have a question from Simon Nadeau in the chat box. Um, so for white pine, you have seen that seed sources generally prefer warmer climates. Did you find this result was generalized all across the white pine distribution, or was it only for the region around Ontario? Um, and I suspect that southern provinces would prefer to be north because climates would become too warm and dry. Yes, yeah, so basically the answer to the first part of the question is yes, the, the result, the general idea is that all populations of white pine would prefer a climatic kind of mean annual temperature of around 11 degrees. So if you're in the southern part of the range and you're, you've got a reforestation program and 11 degrees is actually going to be in the end north of where you are, then that's, that would be the choice in that case. You would, those sources, those, those would deploy that type further north to find the, uh, the, the 11 degree sweet spot. But in Ontario, for the most part, it looks like there would be uh, wanting to what we showed on the map earlier, probably still south because climate change is not going to change things that to, to that degree uh, in the you know middle part of this. Hopefully that answers the question. Perfect. Great. Uh, and it looks like we have one last question here in the chat box. So, do climate habitat models take soil evolution models into consideration? Um, I'm not sure I know what you mean by soil evolution. Now, one of the things that you know, I have been asked about in the past, oh yes, we could try to incorporate soil, these kind of models, and, and actually do migration modeling, and that's one of the things we, we are kind of in the midst of trying to do. But for the most part, you know, soils, soils are going to stay in place, <laughs> and, and uh, for the most part, in the time frames that we're talking about. Um, and when you add soils in models like these, it, it kind of makes the story worse, in the sense that you would have less area suited to the future potential distribution. So, okay, and I use the word potential, it's not actual. So, um, uh, you know, we have thought about trying to incorporate soils into this, where some of the research that we wanted to do to look at migration pathways, but things get very much more, I'd say, tricky and a little bit tenuous because with, uh, you know, you're, you're just basically invoking more and more assumptions about what we understand about species ecology and interaction, competition, how things move in tandem, even processes like uh, uh, male and female flowering and how that might be affected going forward. I think that's another quite important question for the science community thinking about because that's, uh, I think, a bit of a a hit risk going forward that uh, as um, <clears throat> temperatures change quite dramatically, there, there may be situations where the, the climatic triggers for male and female flowering become more and more out of sync. But that's hard to know. It might not take a long time. Maybe it won't happen, but I think it's something. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Uh, okay. I don't see anybody else typing. I guess this is our last call for questions. So whether via the chat box or conference call live. One question. Sure, go ahead. Go yeah. Could you flip to the, the black spruce uh, net present value on the table? Okay. The, okay, there was only one. I took out the deployment one. So this one here. Yeah, so when I look at the 
just wondering about relative error. If you look at the results on, say, mean fan volume, from roughly, yep. point, roughly 0.5 T-square index to 1.0 T-square index, it's within 10% of itself, yeah. like 5%. So is that essentially a plateau that once you get above roughly 0 0.5, 0 0.4 even, is that close to the same result? Or is uh, that within yeah. error, that result? Yeah, I would say that that's, you know, because, first of all, black spruce is a fairly slow-growing species. So, um, you know, the, mo uh, the models are not going to show that much difference. Um, so, yeah, that's a good observation there that you made. Um, and... As I think the question from here was suggesting is, you know, what do you gain and lose from using local sources into the future? Uh, you may lose a little bit of productivity, but it may be a bit of a of a risk, uh, uh, well, less of a risky strategy, if you like, if you're concerned about getting things started and you don't need to worry too too much about productivity. Does that kind of answer your question? So yeah, and then the white pine table. Yeah, just a reaction. A few of us in the room. I guess these are gross volume. We were quite impressed with yeah. the 750 meters. Yeah, pine. they are. Yeah, no, I. Um, they were quite willing to take some uh, uh, advice or collaboration on uh, development of, of these kinds of yield tables. We worked a bit with our group who recently retired here. We all oh, got some advice from. I don't want to. Implicate the poor guy on, on that. But, um, it, it, um, uh, yes, those would be gross volumes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Any last questions? We have about three minutes left. I don't want to keep anybody Did over. You all answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> you got a lot of answers up the top if you scroll up, so that's good. So, Dan, are people able to email you if, if they have any? Other questions or okay, perfect. So given the time, I guess we'll wrap things up here. So thanks to everybody who joined us today for the webinar. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, and before everyone logs off, I just have a quick announcement that um, the FA COP is currently looking for two webinar presenters for the month of March. So if anybody is on the line that would like to either present their research or project or know something that would be interested in doing so, please contact either myself or Jason, and our email addresses uh, were in the chat box there. Um, so with that, I guess a very big thank you to you, Dan, for your time and effort and for a great and informative presentation and a great discussion as well. Um, any last comments from you before we uh, sign off? Well, I, I think I see Melissa's asked a question about oh, what other species. I missed um, one. <laughs> yeah, what, white spruce is one. Uh, actually, Penjing Lu at the uh, Oak Green next door to us here has uh, some URF models for white spruce, that's another possible candidate species. Um, any species that has had um, um, basic provenance type work done. Oak, uh, there have been some oak trials that have been developed that I know Benjing was hoping to be able to uh, measure. Uh, hopefully, find the funding to do that. I'll make a plug for that. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I think you know, any the more and more species that we can get a handle on stuff for or do this kind of work for us, better. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, Melissa, I missed your question, but glad Dan caught that. All right. So if everybody is uh, okay, we can uh, wrap things up. And then any additional questions, obviously, you have Dan's email, so please feel free to contact him as well. So. Uh, with that, uh, thanks everybody for joining us today.